Take that, loser. I don't know what he's doing in there, but he better be building some code. Die, die, die. I think I better go in there and see what's going on. Let's just go and see. What? I need that code built. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll have that built. Okay, don't worry. Like yesterday. I, I have the project right here. I'm just taking a little break. I hope so. Why would any programmer want to use a gaming laptop like this one for programming? This video is not sponsored. Actually, it's sponsored by me. I bought all these laptops. <laughs> If you are developing games, it's probably a no brainer for you that you want to test what you're building, right? So in that case, sure, get a gaming laptop. But what about the other 99% of developers out there? All right, I just made up 99%. I don't know how many developers are not game developers, but I would guess it's the majority. So for the rest of us, gaming laptops are just called high performance laptops. Like this one, for example, I bought this machine. This is the uh, Asus Rogue Strix G15. It's got a Ryzen 15900HX processor in it. It's a very good performing machine. I don't use it for gaming. I have kids, but uh, I bought it to do some comparisons with the M1 MacBooks for this channel and also because it has an Nvidia RTX 3070 GPU in it, which allowed me to do some of the machine learning tasks much faster than anything I have available to me at that point. The Intel MacBooks were pretty terrible at uh, GPU tasks because they didn't have a GPU really. They were doing everything on the CPU. And while the M1s did have an eight core GPU, it still wasn't enough to compete with an RTX 3070. This is before, of course, I had the MacBook Pro, with the M1 Max chip in it. I could probably use that one from now on to do my ML tasks, but I still prefer using this gaming machine for my related work because I use PyTorch and not TensorFlow and PyTorch doesn't yet support Apple Silicon while TensorFlow does. It's a long story. I recently did a video on this uh, uh, I'll link to it up here or down below. Most of my development work I do on my MacBook and when it's time to do the heavy lifting, that processing, I'll still transfer it to the gaming laptop to do that processing. Now that's just my personal weird workflow with this gaming laptop. But uh, if you were another kind of developer, why would you want to use a gaming laptop if you are not doing machine learning or game development? By the way, I'm curious to know if you are a developer, do you use a gaming laptop or a non-gaming one? Let me know in the comments. So when the adjective gaming is used, most people tend to think and then jump to the conclusion that we're always talking about a super laptop that's expensive and noisy and so on. In reality, gaming laptops are a wide range of laptops. There's gaming laptops and then there's gaming laptops. Yes, it's got the funky look to it and it's geared towards gamers. But at this point, this one costs about $1,500 to under $2,000. The top models, the super gaming laptops will cost around around $5,000 and more. And then there's entry level gaming laptops also that are around maybe $1,000. Now they're not the same, not even close. Their specs are entirely different, but they're all still gaming laptops. And there are a few traits that the gaming laptops offer that are common, whether you use a high-end one or a low-end one. I wouldn't exactly call any gaming laptop a low-end laptop, but on the lower end of gaming laptops. And uh, these are the kind of points I want to discuss today in relation to programming. So the first question is, do you need to spend $5,000 on a laptop for programming? Definitely not. Unless you do, you unique stuff. You want to have uh, the type of machine for whatever reason that appeals to you, right? It's not a crime and uh, you do what you want with your money. It's like driving a Ferrari. Uh, more on that later. In general, gaming laptops are going to be more expensive than non-gaming laptops. So it really all boils down to your budget. If you have a larger budget, then you can certainly opt for a high-end gaming laptop that'll get you more RAM, more CPU and GPU juice. And it also matters what kind of developer you are. If you're a web developer, you probably don't need anything more than an eight gigabyte machine. Although these days, I'd actually highly recommend 16 gigabytes at least because your needs as a developer will typically grow the longer you practice practice your craft. 
Here's kind of my rule of thumb for RAM, okay? Get 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes. They're all great range for developers and you can't go wrong right now. If you don't know how much RAM you need, and this is a really common question, get 16 and get 32 if you can spare the extra change. But if you're asking whether you need a 64 gigabyte machine, only get a 64 gigabyte machine if you know you need a 64 gigabyte machine. And now I'm gonna amend that rule of thumb by saying that get an eight gigabyte machine only if you know you need an eight gigabyte machine. Here's an example. If you don't have 50 Chrome tabs open and you use Vim, then you're likely gonna use the eight gigabyte machine. Now, if you're doing mobile development or if you're using Docker or virtual machines, you'll wanna skip the eight gigabyte machine and go for at least 16 and I'd even go higher than that. When writing code, you're basically doing text editing and you can just use an old Android's tablet worth of machine power for that. But typically these days with the environments and all the stuff going on and the setups for any developer really, that's not all you're going to ever need, is it? On one extreme, you may even have three to five Docker containers running at any given moment and several different virtual machines configured under VirtualBox that may or may not be running. I'm just giving an extreme example here, but hey, it could happen. And then you can be like me and have 30,000 tabs open in Chrome. I do a lot of different things, so. I I have, uh, let's see, web dev, mobile dev, machine learning, 3D printing, <laughs> writing in Google Docs. I have a couple of Slack tabs open for the different groups that I'm in. Yeah, so I have a lot of tabs open. I don't know how I got here, just a bad habit, I think. But I also don't think it's that uncommon these days. I also have another monitor with a bunch of code editors open, um, as well as some Adobe tools scattered around Photoshop, Audition, and uh, I don't have Premiere Pro open all the time, but sometimes I do when I'm editing. My main machine now is 64 gigabytes of MacBook Pro. And right now, somehow it's showing that I'm using 29 gigabytes of RAM. I have no idea what's using all that, but it seems to me like the more RAM you have, the more it'll be eaten up, right? Now I can try to purge some of that using this tool. By the way, I'm using this free memory tool by Parallel. It comes with a Parallels toolbox along with a ton of other tools that I use every day. This is not a sponsored video or anything, but I'm just saying that I really like this toolbox. And when I bought Parallels, I didn't even know that I was getting this toolbox with it. And to be honest, I use this Parallels toolbox more than I use virtual machines. It's got this uh, screen splitter thing. It's got uh, downloading videos, recording screen areas, window manager, free memory. Those are just some of them that I use all the time. By the way, if you want to pick up Parallels for yourself, there's a coupon code down below with an expiration date and click my link. That's an affiliate link. Many of our popular tools these days are also built on top of Electron, including Visual Studio Code. And Electron is known to be a memory hog. When you open five instances of VS Code, you're going to quickly eat up all that memory. So to summarize the RAM requirements, I think as a dev, you really need at least 16. If you do mobile dev like me, then you'll need even more for running device emulators and the ID IDE that you're going to use to build the project and debug the projects. So at that point, go with 32. All right, let's get off a of RAM and talk about cooling. Now I spend a lot of my time compiling projects. A lot of my work has to do with mobile builds that take a while to run, but I also do a lot of testing on this channel with C++, Java, Go, and compiled languages like that. And those generate heat, especially the builds that have multi-core support. A gaming laptop will have a beefed up cooling system that'll be able to handle those kinds of workloads pretty well, as opposed to a sleek and skinny little laptop like a Dell 13 incher. So that's a really big bonus for performance as well, since the system will be able to handle higher temperatures before throttling and slowing down the processor so it doesn't melt. Of course, the downside is that many of these gaming machines will be very loud. But it's uh, nothing that over the year headphones won't be able to solve, right? But if you're coding locally and then offloading your build process to a CI CD pipeline, then you don't have to worry about cooling, of course, and you'll work okay with any laptop, really. Now the keyboard. Many programmers I know aren't exactly delicate touch typists. Now these stats are a little bit old, but inside any given year, there's usually about 20% of the keys that are rubbed off. This used to be the case anyway. Now they make keycaps a little bit differently, but the point is having a more durable integrated keyboard is pretty nice to have. Gaming laptops today might have the keyboards that have carved out letters and they have a backlight 
like that right there. So they definitely won't rub off any letters. And since gamers are expected to pound on their keyboards, you'll typically get a sturdier keyboard on a gaming laptop than let's say on a business oriented laptop. So if you're developing on a gaming laptop, you'll likely not have any issues with the durability of the keys, but keyboard feel is such a personal choice that you might like one keyboard over another and perhaps you'll even want to have a separate standalone mechanical keyboard, but that's a whole different video. Now, your eyes will appreciate HD display with good resolution. Believe me, the first time I tried a MacBook Pro with a Retina display, I was blown away. I could actually sit at a computer for eight hours a day without stopping. Well, that's not really good for you in general, but it's not bad for your eyes anymore. Remember those old screens where you can see every single pixel? Probably not good staring at those all day, right? And we used to just accept that. Now, 4K and 5K displays are pretty common. The refresh rate of the screen also plays a role here and determines how long you can stare at the screen. Gaming laptops tend to have higher refresh rate screens like uh, 120 hertz, 144 hertz. Those are pretty common now. And some even go up to 300 and 360 hertz as well. Now these latter ones are the top tier gaming laptops and will cost a premium price of course. But historically a 60 hertz screen is what's still common even today to find in most non-gaming laptops. And it's typically what developers will ever need. So having a gaming display refresh rate is a bit overkill here. The more important thing to look for is the resolution in my opinion i use two 4k displays they're lg monitors here connected to my macbook pro and they're operating at 60 hertz and they do great for my work now as far as looks go I don't care too much for the crazy LEDs everywhere and the logos and all the sexy angles that are part of the designs of the laptop cases that are gaming laptops. Taking one of these to a client's meeting kind of looks unprofessional. But on the other hand, we developers like our stickers, don't we? So we're going to decorate the shell anyway. At that point, professionalism goes out the window anyway. If you care about looking good in a meeting, take your shell off. All right, final consideration for the day. Is a Ferrari good for driving? I told you I'll come back to the Ferraris. I don't know. I've never driven a Ferrari, but I would imagine the answer is yes. And it's probably way more fun than a regular car, right? Although if you get stuck in traffic, it's not fun at all. But despite all that, you get to be seen driving around in a Ferrari. If you care about that sort of thing, then that's great. Using a high-end gaming laptop is not that much different, in my opinion. Basically, it's more of a laptop than most developers really need, but it's not a sin to own one. So can you use a gaming laptop as a programmer? Of course you can. And you'll probably find that it's gonna perform really well for you. It's gonna do all the things that a regular laptop can do and more. It'll cost you a little bit extra. And if that's the price you're willing to pay for extra performance, then it's a good deal for you, I guess. As for me, I'll continue using this laptop whenever I need a Windows machine. I also have Linux installed here as well. And whenever I need the GPU related work done. But I will still continue using my Tesla, I mean my MacBook for most of my development and other computing needs. Anyway, just wanted to share some thoughts about gaming laptops, especially because there's such a hype about them. Whenever you hear about new laptops coming out, usually all the new technology gets landed in a new laptop, like the Intel 12th generation Alder Lakes. They landed in a gaming laptop first. So I thought I'd talk about that for a second. And if you like this kind of video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for more content and developer related tests. We're gonna be testing. Maybe some of them will be gaming laptops this year. We'll see. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one.